Our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verse 16. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. May God add blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of scripture. As Aaron mentioned earlier, we have started a new series on historical figures in the faith brothers and sisters in Christ who've come before us. And as we sort of travel back through time, we wanted to find a way each Sunday to sort of set the tone, to let us really begin to feel what it would be like to follow Christ in those days, to be part of the church in those days. And so we're going to try to do that each week with music. And so today the person we're talking about lived in the third and fourth centuries. So we found what is so far the oldest known Christian hymn that includes both the lyrics and the music. There are old papyrus that have the lyrics of this song and the musical notation that they used at that time. So this is not only the words, but the music they would have used to sing or to chant to the Lord. Now a theme that they often used at that time, like that let all mortal flesh keep silent, it also dates back to the third century, not the music, but the words. So that was a theme that was very common in worship at that time is Let's still the entire world and know that God is God. Be still and know that I'm God. So shut everything down. Let everything be silent and still before the presence of Christ. And so this is called the Oxyrhynchus hymn from Egypt, which is where the person we'll talk about today lived, from the third or fourth century. It's not the whole song, but here's a sampling of it, and you'll see the English lyrics printed on the screen. Can you imagine monks sitting in a cave or families gathered in a room chanting to the Lord, stilling their souls to know the glory of God? We still do the same today. Let's pray as we open God's Word. Lord, today we ask that you would bring forward to us the lessons you've taught your people in the past. As we look into the life of another brother, we ask that you would show us the connecting points between his life and ours, and between all of our lives in you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, last Sunday we started a new sermon series entitled, The Great Cloud of Witnesses. For the next couple of months, we're going to explore our spiritual genealogy by looking at the lives of nine people from the history of the church. Nine lives that have shaped the world. After last week's introduction, I realized there was a point I had intended to make, but I forgot. One way to think about this series is that even though we'll be focusing on a a diverse group of people, spanning many times and places and unique historical settings, what we'll really be looking at is Jesus. Specifically, the effect Jesus had on each of these lives. Our hope is that by examining His effect on their lives, we can be in a better position for Him to affect our lives. But here's the point I wanted to make. None of these people are Jesus. In other words, even though they each have important ways that they can serve as an example to Christians, 
None of them are the perfect example. Only Jesus is our perfect example. And every one of these people would say the same. So there will be things about each of the people on our list that will seem strange, even unchristlike. In other words, their lives were not perfect. But of course, what would you expect? They're not Jesus. They're followers of Jesus. But I think that should actually be an encouragement to us. Even though each of these people had their flaws, God was still able to work through their lives in a powerful way. In other words, you don't have to have a perfect faith for it to be a saving faith, even a world-changing faith. So let's keep that in mind as we come to the first name on our list, St. Anthony. Born in 251 A.D., He's one of the earliest people in the church to be regarded as a saint after his death. He's known by a variety of names. In his own time, people would have called him Antonius. In English, you'll see him listed both as Antony and Anthony. He's also called Anthony of Egypt, where he lived his entire life, or Anthony of the Desert, because he lived most of his life in the wilderness. Sometimes he's called Anthony the Anchorite, which comes from a Greek word meaning to withdraw. As we'll see, Anthony's whole life was spent trying to withdraw further and further away from the world. Inspired by his example, there were many others who sought to imitate his life. He became a leader and guide to these people, and they called him Anthony the Abbot, or Abba Anthony. He became like a father, not only to the other monks who imitated him in his own time, but to all monks of all times. So he's often just called Anthony the Great, the father of monks. Now when we look back through the lens of history, it's easy to get a glorified picture of someone. He looks pretty serene in this painting, doesn't he? He's gazing up through the frame of the picture as if he's looking right into heaven. But this is where we want to make sure that we get the whole story. Of course, no one actually painted him in his own time. This painting was done in 1635 by a Spanish artist, and the artist is using his imagination. But is this what Anthony would have looked like in real life? Probably not. This might be a little closer. And to get the full impression, we would probably need some kind of smell vision Why? Because his personal hygiene habits were a little severe. This is what his biographer said about him. He had a garment of hair on the inside while the outside was skin, which he kept until his end. And he neither bathed his body with water to free himself from filth, nor did he ever wash his feet, nor even endure so much as to put them into water unless compelled by necessity." In other words, whoever first said cleanliness is next to godliness, it was not Anthony of Egypt. So how in the world did a person like this, who, was by, who had, by the way, no formal education, no position of authority, lived in the wilderness and rejected almost everything about civilized society, even bathing, how did a person like this become a spiritual hero to millions? Well... You have to hear his story. Anthony was born in the year 251 A.D. in a small village in Egypt called Coma. He was from a wealthy family, but he and his younger sister were orphaned when Anthony was about 18. He was raised as a Christian and attended weekly worship with the other Christians in the village. His biographer tells a story of the day that he arrived late to church and his life was forever changed. Now, it was not six months after the death of his parents, and going according to custom into the Lord's house, he reflected as he walked how the apostles left all and followed the Savior, and how they in the Acts sold their possessions and brought and laid them at the apostles' feet for distribution to the needy, and how great a hope was laid up for them in heaven. Pondering over these things, he entered the church, and it happened the gospel was being read. And he heard the Lord saying to the rich man, If you would be perfect, go and sell that you have and give to the poor, 
and come follow me, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Antony, as though the passage had been read on his account, went out immediately from the church and gave the possessions of his forefathers to the villagers. They were 300 acres, productive and very fair, that they should be no more a clog upon himself and his sister. And all the rest that was movable he sold. And having got together much money, he gave it to the poor, reserving a little, however, for his sister's sake. Anthony felt that God was calling him to devote 100% of his time to prayer, to contemplating God, communing with God, truly getting to know God. And in order to do that, he needed to let go of almost everything else in his life. His house, his lands, his possessions, his social standing, his personal relationships, even his creature comforts, good food, and fine clothes. So he left everything behind and went out into the desert alone. He thought that if he could let go, if he could strip his life down to nothing but the essentials, then God would finally come into focus. He reasoned that when God was all he had left, God would fill up his whole vision. This discipline is called asceticism, abstaining from worldly pleasures in order to pursue spiritual goals. If you can boil your life down to one thing, love for God, then that one thing will become truly real. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What does it mean to be pure in heart? It means you only have one goal. You only want one thing, God. If God is what you truly want, then God is what you'll get. So, how long did Anthony practice his life of asceticism? Well, he went out into the desert at age 18, and he stayed there until he died when he was 105. Anthony led a life of self-denial and self-discipline for 87 years. Our scripture for today talked about how Jesus had similar practices at times in his life. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Do you remember when Jesus was tested by the devil? Where did that happen? In the wilderness. Anthony built his whole life around that same kind of solitude and silence and testing. And what happened? What did he learn? Did he really get to know God in a deeper way? In addition to the biography written about him, we also have some surviving sayings of Anthony of Egypt. Here are just a few that tell something about how he experienced God in those years. He wrote... Some have afflicted their bodies by asceticism, but they lack discernment, and so they are far from God. In other words, it's not just what we do without, going without food or conversation or possessions. It's what we choose to replace those things with. Do you remember the time that Jesus was talking to the woman at the well? Why was he there by himself with no disciples? Because the disciples had gone into town to get some food. And so, while they were gone, Jesus talks with this woman. And as they did, she began to know God in new ways. Eventually, she and her whole community, the whole town, put their faith in Christ. When the disciples got back with the food, they urged Jesus to eat something. And do you remember his reply? I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Jesus had not been eating physical food but he was being nourished by spiritual food. Fasting in general isn't just about what you subtract, it's about what you replace it with. Removing something that's normally part of your life makes it possible to fill that space, fill that time with something new. Some new way of seeking after God that there wasn't room for before. 
Most of us know that it's, it's important to have a balanced diet. Fruits and vegetables, proteins, carbs, fats, vitamins, all that stuff. But do we have a healthy diet of spiritual food? Are we consuming any spiritual food at all? It's possible to just eat the spiritual candy. The stuff that tastes good in the moment and feels good going down. It's possible to stay on spiritual milk, says scripture, and not move on to the more solid, nourishing foods. Do we have a balanced spiritual diet? Here's another of Anthony's sayings. Just as fish die if they stay too long out of water, so the monks who loiter outside their cells or pass their time with men of the world lose the intensity of inner peace. I don't know about you, but when I hear about Anthony's life, how he deprived himself of so much for so long, I think most of us would want to ask him, how can you stand to do without all those things, all those normal things of life? But it seems that Anthony looked at it in exactly the opposite way. I think he would want to ask us, how can you stand to do without solitude and silence? How can you do without the uninterrupted fellowship with God that only comes in solitude and silence? All the distractions, the competing interests, all the demands on your time. I don't know how you stand it. What about you? How good are you at solitude and silence? I don't mean just watching TV by yourself for an hour or sitting in a room filled with people, but you don't know anyone there. I mean total solitude. No human interaction at all. Total silence. No mental stimulation whatsoever. Just you, by yourself, with God. Do we even have opportunities for that these days? Anthony may have had an easier time finding solitude. After all, where did he live again? Egypt, in the third and fourth century. So if you look at this map, what is that green area that runs down the center? That's the fertile part along the banks of the Nile River. Because it's so fertile, that's where all the people are. That's where all the cities and towns are. But what about the rest of it? It's all empty desert wilderness for hundreds and hundreds of miles, especially back then. So when Anthony wanted to leave society behind, all he had to do was start walking. And before long, he could have all the solitude he could stand. What about us? If you wanted to jump in your car this afternoon and abandon society, how far would you have to drive to find a place that nobody owned and where no one ever went? Is there even such a place? The only land I've ever heard of that is unclaimed by anyone is Antarctica. But it's kind of hard to get to. So if we want to find silence and solitude, we have to be a little creative. What are some things that we could do? How about a spiritual retreat center? Have you ever been to one of those? With just a little searching, I found several places in the DFW area that offer spiritual retreats. You can be silent for days on end. There are people there who can help you. How about spiritual direction, speaking of people who can help you? Again, in our area, there are hundreds of people who've been specially trained to help you do just what Anthony did. Know God personally through prayer and silence and solitude. Have you ever done spiritual direction? Over the past 14 years, I've had four different spiritual directors who lived in four different cities. I can tell you, they know what they're doing. They can help you in your spiritual life. But that's a lot of trouble, isn't it? I mean, finding a spiritual director or setting aside time to go on a spiritual retreat. Sounds like a lot of work. It makes me think of another of Anthony's sayings. A brother said to Abba Anthony, pray for me. The old man said to him, I will have no mercy on you, nor will God have any, if you yourself do not make an effort and if you, you do not pray to God. So it seems like for someone who was silent most of the time, when he decided to talk, he didn't mess around. 
The truth is, no one can have a relationship with God for us. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Jesus is ready to know us, to be in fellowship with us. But we have to ask. We have to seek. We have to knock. Maybe it's time for you to go on a spiritual retreat. Maybe the time has come for you to get a spiritual director. Or maybe there's some other way that God is calling you to ask, to seek, to knock. I wonder if it's occurred to us, people like Anthony throughout history have chosen to simplify their lives and get rid of a lot of stuff so that they could be present with God more intensely. Is this time of isolation that's been forced upon us, could this be God's way of doing what we couldn't do for ourselves? Is it possible that this time of isolation is God saying, ask me, seek me, knock on the door. I've taken this other stuff out of the way so you have less excuse. Come to me. I want to know you. One more story from Anthony about the effect that his story had on people who've heard it through the centuries. Most of the information we have about Anthony comes from the life of Anthony written by Athanasius of Alexandria. Athanasius knew Anthony personally and wrote the book shortly after Anthony died. It became an instant success. It was available in four languages even back then and seems to have been second only to the Bible in popularity. And when people read it, it had a powerful effect on them. One man told a story years ago, centuries ago, of how a royal official had told him about his first experience of the book. He and two other officials were visiting a Roman province with the emperor. They worked for the emperor. And they were stopped. They stopped in to see some friends. And these friends had a copy of a new book, The Life of Anthony by Athanasius. And when the friends began to read it aloud, the Holy Spirit started working on one of these royal officials. Here's what it says in the ancient account. Then suddenly, being overwhelmed with a holy love and a sober sense of shame, in anger with himself, he cast his eyes upon his friend, exclaiming, Tell me, I entreat you, what end are we striving for by all these labors of ours? What is our aim? Can our hopes in court rise higher than to be ministers of the emperor? But if I desire to become a friend of God, behold, I am even now made it. Now I have broken loose from those hopes of ours, and I am determined to serve God. And this, from this hour in this place, I enter upon. If you are reluctant to imitate me, hinder me not. When this man heard about Anthony's life, about how he wanted to completely know God with his whole self, becoming a friend of God, this man said, I want that too. Who was this official talking to when he heard the story of this transformation? A young man named Augustine. Born just two years after Anthony died, hearing about his life was one of the key events in Augustine's own conversion. And Augustine would play a pretty important role in the history of the church. If Anthony could ask us one question, I think it might be this. What do you truly want? All the stuff you've been running after all these years? Or to be the friend of God? Because in the end, each of us has to choose. Let's pray. Lord, we do want to know you. And in our hearts, we realize that we only have room for so much. We can't have room for you if our heart is filled with too many other things, too many other distractions, too many other obsessions or habits. So we ask you to give us the courage to pray the prayer of asceticism. 
Show us the things in our lives that won't fit, that aren't healthy. Show us the place that only you can occupy and give us the courage to clear everything else out of the way. It could be that even now in this time of change, you're offering us opportunity. Let us not miss it. We ask it in your name. Amen.